how did you get involved in affiliate marketing actually? I take a look at what my friend Conrad does on the internet. He was working from home and making crazy money. How much did you did you invest at the start? I spent 500 and I made 1500. I was shocked. Do you think it $2000 is enough to start now uh, in affiliate marketing? What well, was it decent income for you to to organize the kind of parties? In uh, Serbia I lost cuz the amount of work that we put in, it worked out to around half a euro per hour, half euro per hour, like the, we pay the cleaner one euro per <laughs> hour. Like. Basically what I'm willing to provide is uh, one hour consulting with me starts at $2,000 where we look at what you're already doing when you're, where you're struggling and then together sit down and come up with an action plan on what you can do to improve and make more money. So Probably they exist and maybe they work. Like especially on push net, the push uh, traffic source. What the push traffic exactly is and how it works, I'm going to show you right now. For that, we go to Mega Push, which is the first push notification network with incredible amount of traffic. And I just show you how to set up a campaign there. It's very simple. First campaign name, just test in my case, will really do. Then you need to paste a link to your landing page or an offer. In my case, it will be our interview on YouTube. Title, that is how our notification message will be titled. Attila interview in my case. Message goes after. I'm just putting continue to watch. That is mine call to action. Image, the main part of our notification. So make sure to choose something that attracts attention. Icon is a small picture next to your message, good to put your logo for example. So targeting, I'm in Jamaica right now, so the cost per click starts at one tenth of a cent. Device, desktop, OS, Mac, you can also specify time range, IP range, more options are available. And here is what we have got. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward, now we are waiting our notification to be approved. The good thing about Mega Push is that they have their moderation process going on 24-7 and it usually approved very fast. Try it out as Mega Push also gives 15% bonus on your first top up, which simply means free traffic. Here you go. That's how our push notification looks like. And we continue to watch our interview. Enjoy. Hi. I'm Roman from Zorbas Media and today we are in Budapest to meet Attila, serial entrepreneur as well as super affiliate and creator, the most popular blog about affiliate marketing and uh, hi Attila, it's a hey, pleasure nice to, to meet you. you. You too, man. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming to Budapest. Let's go see the city. Yeah, let's do. I'm super excited. Just wanted to ask you what did you want to be when you were a child? I wanted to be like a business owner like my dad. Uh huh. So your dad was a businessman as well? Yeah, like uh, when I was little, he, he owned uh, like grocery store and uh, grocery stores actually because uh, we lived in uh, Serbia, like I was born in Serbia. And after that, we moved to Hungary and he owned two grocery stores there. And later we immigrated to Canada. And in Canada, when we moved there, we didn't, he didn't speak the language or anything. So he started working for somebody and later he opened his own business too. So that's where I get the entrepreneurial spirit, you know, wanting to be my own boss. How, how old were you when you immigrated to Canada? Uh, 11 and a half years old. Okay. Could yeah. you speak any English? Uh, I spoke very little, just what we learned in school. But when, I, when we moved to Canada, I realized that's nothing, you know, <laughs> like it's zero English, basically. I remember being super shy, um, even just talking like saying thank you and stuff like that like it was I was feeling super uncomfortable let I realized I know nothing you know so I basically um, when I started school they threw me into ESL classes and uh, I was basically the only white guy among Chinese people because right. uh, you know like Vancouver has a heavy Asian population and a lot of migrants from Asia like uh, China and Hong Kong and Taiwan and stuff so I quickly became friends with uh, a lot of Asian kids, you know, like um, from all over the place. And uh, this is how I discovered sushi. Like before, before that, I never in my life ate sushi. <laughs> but one, one time I remember at lunchtime we were hanging out and one of my friends, um, 
he brought these weird things. I didn't know what the heck they are because I never seen them before. <laughs> um, and um, and then he told me sushi, and I tried it. I was like, mm, this is amazing! Like it's a brand new, you know, like taste. Like I never ever experienced it. And do you uh, still like sushi? Oh yeah, it's one of our favorite uh, favorite foods. So much so that when I moved back to Serbia and I met my wife. I started making sushi at home because back then you couldn't buy sushi anywhere, you know, in Serbia. Oh, yeah. And they didn't know about it and everything. So I bought ingredients and it didn't work out good. Then I found on eBay that you can order. So I ordered from Japan ingredients <laughs> and I made sushi and um, and slowly they started loving it and they kept asking like, when are you going to make sushi? When are you going to make sushi? And his entire, like her entire family uh, got hooked on sushi and always wants to, you know, me to make it and stuff like that. How often do you drink alcohol? Not often enough. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't because I have responsibility, especially the kids. You know, you have to help them with homework, like my son especially. Um, then give them a bath and my little girl and put them to bed and all that stuff. and next time take them to school but we try you know have on the weekends especially wine so are you more wine kind of person yeah more wine definitely definitely <laughs> this was awesome <laughs> Canada and why did you decide to, to get back to Europe? Oh, I lived, uh, I think, 11 or 12 years or more. Wait a sec. Uh, yeah, around 11, 12 years. And the reason why I moved back is because I used to organize all nights, uh, all night dance parties in Canada. And uh, they were licensed. So you would go to the city, apply for a license, have a meeting, discuss, you know, fire and insurance and all this other stuff. Too many rules. Yeah, but we were always compliant. And then they decided, due to too many complaints from the like from the residents, that they don't want to allow legally this ev these events. So I decided at that point that it's, uh, you know, like I'm not going to do it black hat, if you will, you know, <laughs> underground, because those always got busted and they were dangerous and stuff like that. So we came to Serbia because uh, my grandparents were living in Serbia and stuff. And uh, we came to, I came to Serbia and said, let's do a party here. And then the first time was 5,000 people that we organized. And that's how I met Dora, basically. Uh, how, how did you meet her? Well, uh, uh, when, um, what happened was I came uh, from Canada and we were doing the party. We already had the flyers and everything. And uh, I had a friend who started an online store uh, which was one of the first, you know, in Serbia. And I asked him, do you know any girls who could help come from all the party? He's like, yeah, I know one. You know, she works for like Benson and Hedges and like uh, Johnny Walker and these huge brands, you know, like promoting them and stuff. And I was like, okay, cool, let's call her. And I call her up and I say, hey, I'm Attila from Canada, you know. <laughs> and then, do you want to come, you know, promote my party? And she's like, no. And then comes up on me. <laughs> and after... Um, did, after, you, did you call her back or no i yeah. never never but after i heard you know later from her that she thought i was a complete jerk and stuck up ass you know <laughs> like they left from canada <laughs> like it's so funny and uh, anyways we moved on and somehow um her sister came to promote and her sister's girlfriends and uh then she heard from her sister that i'm actually a really cool guy you know totally different than the guys there and then Dora's like, okay, I'll come promote, and then the rest is history. Basically, we've been together since then. Well, was it decent income for you to, to organize the kind of parties? In Canada, yes. In uh, Serbia, I lost everything on the first two events. And then Dora helped me organize the third one, and then we made 10,000 euros profit, which isn't a lot because the amount of work that we put in, it worked out to around half a euro per hour, if you were uh -huh. to calculate it. And we realized, like, fuck, you know, like, this half euro per hour, like, the, we paid a cleaner one euro per <laughs> hour, like, Jesus, you know, like, and then we decided, ah, okay, that's it, we're not going to do any more events, it's not worth it. And um, <clears throat> when was your last time you go to rave kind of party? 
when I I never went to raves. Like I I didn't like to rave. I just like that kind of music. I still listen to it today. Like here in Budapest, like you have a DJ called Nigel Stately, and he plays plays like deep house and progressive on Music FM. And I usually listen to him while driving. But I never really was the person who went to a rave party to party like dance and get high on drugs. I used to go because I loved the atmosphere, you know, the laser lights and the effects and the huge speakers and the decorations and stuff like that. So that's the whole reason why I actually started organizing, you know, all night dance events so that I could actually play with these things, the controllers and program the laser shows and all that stuff, you know. So that's how it all cool. started. And would you consider yourself as a businessman? or an affiliate marketer? What goes first? Well, definitely business, especially as I grow older, because when uh, I was younger, I used to enjoy sitting there all day. Like I could sit 16 hours on the computer and I would just get up just to go to the bathroom or to grab something to eat quickly and then go back and just sit there all day and I would emerge myself in the cyber world, <laughs> you know? And, and it, it was awesome, but now I'm getting bored, you know, like it's not the same. Like now I just enjoy, you know, like coming up with ideas, coming up with solutions and just calling a bunch of my, you know, employees, do this, do this, delegating and stuff like that. I still enjoy, you know, challenges, new ones, like now trying to make econ work in shitty geos that usually don't work and then writing down the lessons like I published recently in this how I blew $2,300 guide, you know? Yeah, that was, that was your recent post, the Reddit. Yeah, yesterday. exactly. Yeah. So you're still uh, trying to make e-commerce work. In. Because I read in your blog, uh, in one of your posts, that you didn't really like it. No, I don't, you... I don't like drop shipping from China. Uh -huh. Because I believe that for e-commerce to work, uh, it has to work like my companies, like my banners, landers, for example. We know that the uh, we know the lifetime customer value there, and it's not uh, we don't have to break even on the front end, if you will. Like so, we can afford to spend way more on advertising. We can afford to you know test more and all that stuff because we know that every client that we get is going to return and order more stuff. And the reason why that is is because we do you know really good work for super cheap and super fast. And affiliates need tons of landers, tons of banners and uh, tons of, uh, you know, like safe sites for Black Hat. And they cannot afford to work with Upwork people because they'd be like, yeah, I'll give you a WordPress site for $500. Yeah, yeah. And then true. what if you need, you know, 1,000 per month? Then we'll be like, okay, 50 bucks, you know, for one and stuff like that. So, you know, like if you order a large quantity, then we give insanely cheap price. And uh, it makes no sense for others to, you know, for, for you to try working with Upworkers and build your own team because you know, like we take care of all the HR, you know, a lot of people get sick, they want to leave and, you know, like there's so much pain in the ass work that yeah. goes on behind the scene. How many people work for banners and landers now? Well, we have over 50 scattered all 50. over the place, yeah. Oh my God, that's quite a lot. And, uh, well, I presume that you have lots of customers and most of them. Oh yeah, are... we have over 4,700 customers. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot. <laughs> So you first, uh, you first try affiliate marketing in like 96, 97? Yes. And that was like 23 years ago, were you like 12 or 13? No, 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 not that early. Like I tried it in 1997, 1998. Uh -huh. I was 14 and 15. And, and can you tell a bit more about that Yeah, like I used to, used to build like Warris sites. Like it, it, that was the day of uh, GeoCities and uh, like GeoCities and Fortune City. And uh, what you would do is you would get like two megabytes of free storage space. And on Fortune City, back then you would get 10 megabytes. So we would take, you know, different kind of apps and we'd split them up into different RAR files, upload them and then link them from our sites. And we placed banners on these sites. And my first banner that made me good money was Cyber Thrill Casino. Like every time someone clicked on it, I got five cents. So we were just... Per click or per view? Per click. Okay. Yeah, per click. And another thing we ran was All Advantage. What and was it? Basically what it was is that uh, you got paid to have uh, like an ad bar installed on your computer. So while you were on the internet, you were looking at ads, you were getting paid. And then there was like, you know, like a hack 
kind of thing on how to make it as if you were looking at the ads, but in reality you weren't, you know, so... And did you, did you make decent money? Well, for being, you know, so young, it was pretty good, a couple of thousand dollars a month, you know, like, in high school. And how long did it last? I don't know, like eight, nine months, something like uh, that. Yeah. And why didn't you proceed? I don't know, because I, well, actually, I do know, uh, first of all, because I didn't even know that it was affiliate marketing. I had no idea what I was doing, you know, so I didn't know where to go from there. And uh, that's when I, like, met my uh, first girlfriend, and then, you know, it was all about her and stuff, and... Uh -huh. uh, I lost interest in computers and all that stuff <laughs> back then. And yeah, I remember. That happens to boys. Yeah, like the puppy yeah, love. 16 or so. Yeah, so <laughs> that was that. <laughs> so you didn't know back then about affiliate marketing? No, just, I had no clue. How did it was that happen? They contacted no. you themselves, like that casino. No, my friend, I was talking to you know, other kids on the net, and then they said, why don't you, you know, you can some banners on your site and make money I was like okay I put the banner and that was it you know I wasn't too smart in that regard so. was it your first money ever earned uh, no it wasn't the first one because I was building websites for others so uh, I was building websites and uh, getting paid to make websites and I remember I published a book for somebody where uh, what I had to do is I used Quark Express to manually format the book and write the page numbers and add pictures. Cool. How, and how, how old were you? I think I was 15 years old when oh, okay. I did it. Yeah. And when did you build your first website? Well, 14 years okay. old. I remember it was called the Avengers site and I, I had it loaded with uh, GIF animations, you know, like from The Simpsons and other funny ones I found. You know, back then it was a big deal, but today, like, you have kids that are like seven, eight years old making websites, you know? But back then it's like, it was brand new technology, as you know. Today it's not a big deal if a 40 year old makes a website. Back then it was like, whoa, my God, you know? But now my son's making a website and like flash presentation, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> If your son tell you one day, Dad, I want to be involved in affiliate marketing, I want to try it out, what would you feel? I would feel excited, you know. I would teach him, you know, how to do it. And I would uh, introduce him right away to some of the best guys in the industry, you know, <laughs> so that he has a head start. Because one of the most important things in uh, affiliate marketing, like any other uh, industry, is... Uh, being, uh, you know, well connected and knowing the right people. So <laughs> I would definitely help with that. You know, I'd tell him the technical stuff or I'd, you know, I'd point him for the new guy to Charles NGO's UV guide, you know, like you read it. But uh, in terms of connections, I'd introduce, you know, you want to talk to this guy, you want to like, hey, this is my son, you know, like hook him up. Part of the business, like, yeah. <laughs> it'd be funny. Definitely. And is he aware of what you are doing? Like, how do you explain to him your job? Oh, he knows that I'm working on the computer, All right. you know, and doing stuff in Photoshop and ads and things like that. Like, he understands because, uh, as we were talking earlier, like, kids these days are super smart. Like, when you and me were younger, we didn't have computers, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have nothing like that. But these kids, they were born into it, you know? Well, I got my, my first computer when I was 14. Before that, I just would go to my friends and, you know. Yeah, I know, I know, like... There was a back in the old gold, you know, the olden days, like internet cafes where you would yeah. go and stuff like that. I and would spend nights in internet cafes, which is, uh, you know, playing those kind of games like Counter Strike. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, like those huge Counter Strike cafes and all that. But I never played, you know, like the only thing I used to play is when I was in high school, in the summers especially, with my sister, I used to play Quake, oh, like yeah. Weapons Factory, that was Capture the Flag, that was my favorite game. You'd have to run into enemy territory, grab the flag, and then uh, there were different roles, like uh, I was always a sniper, and uh, she was a gunner, so I would go in and grab the flag, and she would be like my defense, and shooting everybody who tried nice. to get me, you know, so teamwork. teamwork, it was good, yeah. Do you play any computer games now? No, no time, you know, like I'm lucky that I can finish a campaign before the little ones want to play or something. And how many hours do you normally nowadays spend in front of your computer? I definitely, like, when my, I take my son to school, uh, and after that uh, I get home and I sit down and then until he, I have to go pick him up. So definitely a good six hours during the day, 
and another two, three at night. So every day I put in eight to nine hours, you know. More or less normal work. Normal work, yeah. Spread out a little bit. A little interruptions here and there. How did you get involved in affiliate marketing, actually? Well, uh, as a, like we talked about it before, when we were driving around yeah. Budapest, um, I used to organize all-night dance events, but they turned out a failure, right? So we didn't make any money, so it was a matter of, okay, we're going to move to Canada, and I'm going to get a job, you know, and uh, take Dora with me and live there, or we're going to stay back in Europe, close to Dora's family, and... Uh, do something so she she should, should uh, suggested that um i take a look at what my friend conrad does on the internet because he's a guy that i met in canada and he lived in my city and everything and we were friends and he all of a sudden moved to poland back to his home country mm -hmm. and uh, he was working from home and making crazy money and it turns out that the guy actually built an empire creating tube scripts for adult porn sites basically so he's, he's Mag Bunny Media, Conrad, like a lot of uh, people actually know the guy. So I looked on what Conrad does and I realized that he's, you know, like a programmer. And I was like, oh my God, I can't program nothing, you know, like I suck at that stuff. But I found the industry that you can build websites, SEO them, rank them, and then make money, you know, promoting different kind of pay sites. So that's how I got started. I was writing the content, making blogs for different niches, and then that's how I got started. So you started with sell. I started with, uh, yeah, with adult and with SEO, yes. All right. And uh, when you first tried media buying? Well, what happened is I was doing really good in uh, SEO for around four years, five years. And then Google came out with like Penguin, Panda, Hummingbird. So all of my sites died out, you know, because uh, it didn't matter. You couldn't trade links anymore and manipulate the SERPs and everything. So what happened was... Uh, I decided to join a forum called I Am Grind. Like it's not around around anymore. Like I read uh, this uh, the Mobile Manifesto by a guy named Rock. It was like an old forum, but that's not around anymore. And uh, I got started on that forum with mobile media buying. And there was also a guy named Tuan Vu, who used to have a blog and stuff. And uh, he used to have like an affiliate network that I worked with and I did adult dating then and I bought, you know, like on Traffic Junkie and ExoClick and stuff like that ads and then created banners, you know, for MILF, uh, MILF sites and stuff like that and then did SOI and DOI, you know, dating lead generation, but I didn't like it. So um, what happened is I was researching and I came across STM, Stack That Money Forum, which I believe is like the number one uh, forum on the internet for affiliate marketing still today. Like there's nothing better than STM in terms of affiliate marketing. And I joined up and I uh, got introduced, you know, to uh, app installs and things like that. And I was super happy because I was able to switch from adult to non-adult. And that's what we've been doing since and then. And when was it? When was media buying? Like five years ago. Five years ago. Yeah. And uh, how, how much did you, did you invest at the start? Well, I remember I had $2,000 on a, like a prepaid card and I decided, I told Dora like, this is either going to work or it's not going to work, you know, like. Was it your last money? No, it wasn't my last money, but I was like, I'm going to dedicate 2K to it. It either works or it's, it's not going to work, you know. So I remember I, at night, like I was working until 10 o'clock, I set up a bunch of campaigns and crazy ass angles like i started in serbia like i was promoting uh du speed booster and clean master mm -hmm. and i created a bunch of campaigns like i remember sir like the like the first campaign in serbia I, that i did for this utility app it was uh like, uh, are you a fan of, you know, the Serbian soccer team, Zvezda, you know, if you like Zvezda fans use this app to speed up their phones, you know, so that was one of my So that angles. wasn't aggressive yet? No, it was not aggressive. And so basically what happened is I was running non-aggressive angles, like, um, you know, if you're a fan of this soccer team, you this is 
what the tool that you need to speed up your phone. And then I started spying because I heard about what runs where, which back then was a really good tool to actually spy on GDN, like Google Display Network and mobile app installs. And then I looked up, you know, these apps are being promoted how? Like the most popular ways. And I saw banners with like exclamation marks, like stop yeah. signs, you know, like your phone is slow, install now and stuff like that. I was like, okay, I tried that angle and I was like, holy crap, you know, like 12% CR, which is insane. And that's how I started, you know, like making profit. And the next day when I woke up, I was like, holy, whoa, you know, I was like shocked, like <laughs> this works, you know. I was like, Dora, come see, like, holy How much crap. that was? How much did you make? Fifteen hundred dollars, you know, $1, profit. $1, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just in the one day. Yeah, because I spent five hundred and I made fifteen hundred. I was shocked, you know. All right. Yeah. That, that, that was cool. Yeah. And uh, do you think it two thousand dollars is enough to start now? Uh, it, it could marketing. be like on Facebook, no. In e-commerce, I don't think so because you need to spend at least a hundred dollars per product and fail fast. But two, three hundred nowadays is even better especially in Q4 where the CPM rates are too high. But in pops maybe and low payout offers it could be. But you would have to know how to, you know, design and do everything yourself and spend all of this money on traffic and know how to block bots and everything from the start. Do, do you know if that apps like cleaners and boosters? Probably or... they exist and maybe they work. Like especially on push net, push uh, traffic source, it's a brand new type of traffic source. Basically, uh, have you tried it so far? Uh, yeah, I do have, but I created my own uh, push uh, traffic source basically. Oh yeah. So what that means is that after you build the list, it costs you nothing to send it. You know, because you can get people to opt in, allow messages so from you. So you have your own uh, base. Yeah, like basically. we have our own database and we can send it for free. And on stuff like this, you can basically run anything because uh, there's no policy right now. But I mean, that's the current state of the market, you know, push. And how big is your database? It's not that big right now. We have like 5,000 people, but uh -huh. it's heavily targeted for a niche that I don't want to talk about that we do right now. But... Uh, the trick to it is being high quality. It's like an email list. But do do you sell do you sell it as a traffic or you monetize the no, the no, database no. We, we monetize it. We okay. send basically every day, uh -huh. three times a day, a message, you know, like about skin, about a special niche that we run and some other things. And then people click. It's basically your own traffic source where you can click, you know, and there's no policy, so you can run anything that you want. Like on Facebook, you cannot use before and after pictures. It's right away disapproved or in the worst case gets your account banned. But uh, on your yeah, own push no traffic rules. source, there's no rules, right? So you can do anything, anything aggressive in terms of shocking, bizarre, untrue, misleading, everything, which is Are what you, you can do. Do you have any plans to grow your database? The problem is, no, I don't really want to go in that direction because I know that push... Uh, the push traffic source is going to come to an end mm -hmm. because how soon is it, going to happen it depends on google right uh, and it depends on android and iphone like if a lot of people are going to complain that they're flooded with spam messages all the time they're going to limit the push where the effectiveness of it drops down like this is a cycle you know like now it's in its infancy stages and it's going to come to mature, you know, it's going to rise up and then die out kind of thing, like any kind of affiliate marketing. But I'm sick of that roller coaster ride, basically. So I'm not focusing on that. Instead, I'm focusing on own brands, like my Banners, Landers, Transy, Anglesaurus, yeah, we'll I am Attila, you know. Uh, I know that you have started having a team from the very first day. Exactly. Is it, is it, is it true? That's true, and, yes. Uh, what I wanted to ask you, if how big your team now i mean the team that is dedicated to traffic arbitrage well now my team is surprisingly smaller than it used to be mm -hmm. and the reason why is because of automation like now we use bots and scripts and automation so i have a guy that i know and when we need some kind of repetitive task automated i talk to him, he writes his scripts for like a 50 to 100 dollars and done it's like having a full-time employee okay you know and they're never sick they never call him with excuses on why the work is not done and nothing so 
that's that's it. So now I work only with seven people who are really, really good, you know. And what is your role within the My question? role is the vision and the creativity in which direction to go. So you come up with... Like, I want to run this, and then I think, like, you know, what kind of angles and, you know, what kind of ways, which traffic sources, and I hand it off. I say, okay, set up the campaign on Facebook, set up on Google, you know, set up on this uh, push notification. So all, all those seven people are doing media buying, right? Not really, no. They basically do it, stuff, they're like my extension. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't like to do repetitive stuff. I hate setting up campaigns. I hate editing videos, you know, all these kind of things. So I just say, okay, I need this translated, for example. I need this video created. Make me banners, you know, like for fa Facebook, like in this size that has this on it, you know. So you're the brain and they are your hands kind of thing. Yeah, that's the way it's going, you know. And can you tell me how, how you find right people to hire? I start them off on, as monkey workers, basically, so they do really simple tasks, and uh, I notice, you know, like people jump out who are really good, who ask questions, you know, who demonstrate some kind of their own ideas, you know, they will tell me, oh, I have a better way on how we can do it, and things like that, so that's how, like, it takes a while to get to know people, especially in this, who I bring closer to work with me. Like I see, you know, talent and then I harness the talent. Like uh, one of my employees, Nikki, like uh, when she started with me, she was just uh, clicking a bunch of buttons, you know. Mm -hmm. And over time she came, she become really good with Photoshop. <laughs> so now when I need banners edited, she can do it better than me, you know. So, for example, like there is a, a picture with some text in it or some person, she can take them out, put some new text in it. And I say, okay, just swap the CTA on these, change the look and feel, stuff like that. And she does it and sends it back and that's it. And she learned on her own, right? So she's getting more of that work. Cool. Yeah. And do you have this point, uh, this question for your candidates, what your parents did and why does it matter for you? Well, we did in the past, but it didn't work out good. Oh, okay. You know why? Because, like, I've been doing this for 10 years now. Like, I had my intern, like, in SEO I started, so it's been 10 years now. And uh, in the beginning, we used to ask that, um, you know, like, what did your parents do? Because I believed if their parents worked hard or they had their own business, then they appreciated work ethic more. But that created problem because we got these mavericks onto the team who thought that, you know, they're worth more than the salary and they should be paid more. So they created politics and all kinds of negative uh -huh. vibes in the company. And that wasn't good for me. Like there was one time that I had an employee who did a good job, but uh, his parents owned some company too. So he was like a good leader and stuff like that. And he knew how to run a team. But he started going around and telling people that, oh, I'm underpaid and all this and all these workers these worker bees started saying like, oh, I'm not getting paid good. And they were getting paid two and a half times the, the average salary in Serbia, you know. Okay. And, um, and then one time I got really pissed, you know, and I came in and I said, I called everybody in and I said that this guy seems like he's a genius. I don't need your help anymore. I appreciate, you know, that you work with me. You guys go and work with the guy, you know. <laughs> And I fired everybody at once. Like everybody. That. Yeah, because, you know, like negative, he brought in negative vibes. And after someone has that fire in them, you cannot extinguish it. You so know, you like, change the team overnight. Yeah, exactly. Basically. I changed it because that's, that's, you know, like it's like a virus. It comes in and you got to get rid of it fast. So. so what kind of questions do you ask now then? Well, what it depends on what you're hiring for, right? We don't really ask questions. We do a test assignment. Uh-huh. Uh, and if they do good, then we give them more assignments and time will tell. But for programmers, then we assign, you know, like a complicated task. And first we see, are they going to do it for, you know, to show us what they know for free? Or will they say, well, you have to pay me for this test, you know? And if they say that, oh, you got to pay me for this tiny, you know, like 10 line code, you know, and how to demonstrate that they do know how to do that, then I'm like, oh, I don't need you, you know, like show me that you're willing to step up kind of thing and, you know, deliver the work. And later we can talk about, you know, compensation and stuff like that. So uh, in your speech that you gave in Berlin, I think that was yeah, in 2016, was in I guess. Mm -hmm. And you told that in May of 2014, you hit one million on revenue yeah, yeah i just wanted to ask uh, about those numbers what 
do they really mean? Was it your monthly revenue or revenue to date or? I think it was revenue to date uh, on one of the networks because we were doing a lot of neutral, like in uh, in um, what was in Nordic countries. Like that's my favorite, you know, like uh, like uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Have you ever had uh, one million plus revenue monthly? No, no, no. No, never hit no. that. Uh, what was your biggest revenue monthly? Like three hundred seventy thousand. That was your record. Yeah, that was. And when was it? I think three years ago, something like that. Three years ago. Yeah. Do you run any black hat campaigns now? Yeah, we do still. Okay, and um, can you give me a definition of black hat? How you understand it? Black Hat is basically any time like a policy is dialed up too too hard, meaning that they disapprove your ads for stupid reasons, and you find a workaround, then you're doing Black Hat. So when you are defining the rules of the traffic source, you're running Black Hat because until the traffic source allows it, it's not necessarily black. You know, it turns black when you have to do sneaky things like cloaking to get it approved. So that's my definition. You do also white hat. Yes, we do white hat. Mostly these days. Mostly. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. Like, what is the percentage of uh, black hat in your revenue? Like 60%. Is black hat. Yeah. And does it take more time than white hat? Uh, it's more repetitive, let's just say. Like, we have to constantly reset up the accounts because uh, you cannot get a lot of uh, spend out of the accounts these days like seven to ten thousand dollars and then it bans you know and Sadly. where do you get uh, your Facebook accounts like uh, do you farm them or you buy well we have our own ways and I can't really tell you unfortunately <laughs> well I we don't need to get into details yeah of course well, we work with suppliers of uh -huh. course and we also get our own like we make our own basically Mm -hmm. Because uh, you never know which one will last. It's so random. Like there's no pattern, you know. And uh, so, how how many accounts do you um, use every day? It it's random. When it goes down, my team will just launch again, you know. Mm -hmm. So we try and keep consistent flow of you know running accounts, like ten accounts a day, always spending money at least. Basically, what I'm willing to provide is uh, one hour consulting with me where we look at what you're already doing when you're where you're struggling and then together sit down and come up with an action plan on what you can do to improve and make more money starts at two thousand dollars so i was thinking that uh, for the person that tells me their story you know and uh, you know about their life how they started in internet marketing you know why they want to continue in internet marketing and how what they're doing is actually helping their friends and their family. I would be willing to select one person from all the stories that are submitted and work with them. So should they just comment on this video on YouTube and uh, you will select the one? Uh, yeah, I think they should comment, yes. Cool. Yeah, and then we can work something. So you heard it. And I think that is a great opportunity. <sighs> Five businesses, let's rank them by profitability. The first one, obviously, that is your arbitrage business. That right? is the top 80%. Honestly, uh, there's nothing as sweet as black hat money. Oh yeah, I wanted to, to talk about your blog a little bit in details. Does your blog um, generate you more than $100,000 profit annually? Oh yes. More than $300,000? Or yes, around. more than three. Can we say it's close to one million? That's why I'm super successful. Like that's why I own three houses and I have nice cars and we travel anywhere we want to go. I went, I went from eighty-six bucks to twenty thousand per Bitcoin. So I mined a ton of Bitcoin. And have you sold them? Or yeah, I you... sold them at twenty thousand, but I still have some. <laughs> And I'm just wondering who died in your headlines. <laughs> <laughs>